Now, some of you are probably looking at me going, whoa. Yes, whoa. Believe me, this wasn't my idea. I call this thing my circus tent. But in a day where we have our huge, and I do mean huge, history timeline laid out in Parish Hall, and in a day in which I am preaching on the robe of Christ, I needed a physical reminder of the robe that he's put on me. This was a gift from a pastor who retired, and I was stepping into his shoes at a church in Oklahoma. And as you can tell, yes, I will step out and show you, there's actually wax on here from probably the last Christmas Eve. So I haven't worn it in a while. But sometimes we need that physical reminder that Christ has called us into something more than we are. And I need that today. You see, this is our fourth Sunday in the book by Max Lucado called He Chose the Nails. Now, the real title of this book is What God Did to Win Your Heart, He Chose the Nails. You need to remember that. The title is very important. And it's really important as we move forward today. Now, I'm going to cover some of the things we've covered in the last four weeks. I mean, we're going to see Jesus suffering on the cross, but today we're going to concentrate on the suffering that Jesus endured before the cross. Because he suffered greatly with something that killed most men, killed them. You see, last week, Audrey covered the crown of thorns. The crown of thorns. Can you imagine wearing a crown of thorns? I know. For me, I, I, I don't want that. And Paul covered the week before that the sign on the cross in three different languages so that we would know that God speaks our language. Speaks our language. There's a course that has been used by a lot of new believers called Alpha. And in the Alpha course, there's actually a story as in the Alpha course they're talking about the Holy Spirit in which a woman came up for prayer to one of the people who was leading the Alpha course. And in the prayer's mind, she was speaking in a biblical language she knew nothing about. Instead, the woman in front of her started crying. And all of a sudden, the woman who's praying over her goes, I'm sorry, have I upset you? She said, no. Did you know you were speaking Russian and saying, I love you, my daughter? Only God can do things like that. He speaks our language. He really does. But, you know, when Audrey covered the crown of thorns, she also touched on the nails. And she said, you know, he saw his human hands and he saw the nails coming at them. Now, any of us would have gone, okay, if we were son of God, son of man, yep, nope, not today. And just made that all disappeared. Or just like Jesus did as he was in his hometown and they were about to throw him off the cliff, just walk through. Nothing happened to him. You see, but Christ knew that it was going to take a lot to cover our sin. A lot. He knew that there was work that needed to be done to claim us. To claim us. Now remember the title of the book, the full title. What God did to win your heart. He chose the nails. As we continue today, we're heading into the governor's house, into Pilate's palace. It's off into a courtyard 
known as the Praetorium. Now, this account is actually in three of the four Gospels of what happens in the Praetorium at Pilate's house. You see, in Luke, he decided to make it kind of Herod's soldiers. So hear this according to Luke. Ridiculed and mocked him, dressed him in a fine robe, and sent him back to Pilate. That's what the soldiers did in Luke. Oh, can I tell you, I wish that's what it was in the other three Gospels. But it's not that easy. It's not that easy. Now, some of you know that I have been wrestling with this passage because you read my devotional on Thursday. And this is a tough thing that Christ goes through. As Max Lucado says in chapter 2, he said, it's hard to find a page in scripture where the animal, meaning the beast, doesn't bear his teeth. There's bloody accounts in the Bible. He says, Cain murdered his brother Abel. King Saul chasing young David with a spear. Shechem raping Diana, Diana's brothers. The sons of Jacob murdering Shechem and his friends. Lot selling out to Sodom and then getting out of Sodom. Herod murdering Bethlehem's toddlers. Another Herod murdering Jesus' cousin. He says, if the Bible is called the good book, it's not because the people are. Blood runs as freely through the stories as the ink through the quills that penned them. But the evil of the beast was never so raw as on the day Christ died. He says, the disciples were first fast asleep, then fast afoot. Herod wanted a show, Pilate wanted out. And the soldiers, the Roman ones, they wanted blood. How many of you have seen the passion of Christ? Okay. When I went to see it, I was in seminary. I had already read this book, and so I knew what was coming when they took him into the courtyard. Now, there was a man sitting on the same row as Paul and I, and he has this big old, I mean, the biggest bucket of popcorn you can imagine, his giant drink, and I'm going, who does that when this is coming? I, I can tell you, that because I knew that the scourging that Christ took, and you need to know that the whip on it that they used, that the soldiers used, had bone at the end of it, or hard metal balls at the end of it. The purpose of those things was to rip open flesh. 39 lashes was a scourging. At the movie... It was more. I couldn't watch. This is how I did it, and I counted. Because I knew when I got to 39, then I might could take my hands down. But it went on. Because the movie, The Passion, is actually seen through the eyes of Christ's mother, Mary. And what mother wouldn't go, oh, that had to be a lot more than 39. A lot more. It's after Christ endures this, and most men died at this point. After he endures this, this is when the soldiers decide to mock him and spit on him. Spit on him. After beating him for 39 times, the praetorium scenes not one that I ever want to see. I mean, Mark gives us this, what I call, AP News account. Mark is one who gets straight to the point, okay? And he says, Then the soldiers led Jesus away into the palace, that is, the praetorium, and called the whole company together. They dressed him in a purple robe, twisted together a crown of thorns, and set it upon his head, and they began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews. They kept striking his head with a staff, 
and spitting on him. They knelt down before him and bowed before him. After they mocked him, they removed the purple robe and put his own clothes back on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. Now, I don't know about you, but when I think about Christ dying on the cross, for some reason, I want to leave out the praetorium. I, I, I don't want to think about it. The cross is enough. I mean, I, I don't know about you, but I've read a physician's account of what all happens to the body when you die on a cross like that. And it's not easy. It's very, very painful and a slow, painful death. So Christ has endured this agony of the praetorium. And then he goes to the cross. Now, remember, the Romans believe they are the masters of the world. At this point in time, they have conquered well over 30 nations. And it was said by some that there were more slaves in Rome than Romans. All of this back in Jesus' time. Now, what you also need to know is that the duty station of going to Jerusalem and not staying in Rome was a step down. Okay? It was not where they wanted to be. They did not like the Jews. And they didn't want to be there. So they were horrible to the people. Horrible. It was not seen as a place of advancement in the Roman militia. It was a punishment. And these men took their aggression out on Christ. They were especially evil in their way of trying to humiliate him. The humiliation we deserve to dehumanize the Son of God. I mean, we know the rest of the story, right? That's the beauty of it. We, we want to gloss right over all of this that he went through and go, ooh, but there's an empty tomb. We know that the grave couldn't hold him, that the huge stone rolled away and Christ was not in there. Yes, good news. But you see, the Son of Man suffered greatly and we can't forget it because we're part of the reason he did actually we're the whole reason he did it I don't want you to miss what all he went through I mean this is Christ who is 100% human and 100% God he didn't have to But he didn't want heaven without us. As a human, to go through all of that, he'd have never made it to the cross. This unimaginable pain that he endured for us, I mean, literally, they pounded the crown of thorns into his head. Pounded it, is what the scripture says. So, what evil done to this man was so needed that way? Why did they have to do it? Why did they have to go to such links and Christ said nothing and he did nothing an innocent man he was the king of kings if they had only known that they were doing this in such a way but their hearts were too hard they couldn't see it they couldn't hear it 
And today, sometimes we read the scriptures like it's a novel and, and we start going, okay, Christ, you're the hero here. Come on, you can get up. You can do this. You don't have to take it because we know who you are. We've read the rest of the story. And I'm pretty sure I'm not worth this. And humanity may not be worth it. Why, Jesus, why would you do this? Why would you take on this? This kind of pain and keep going. How could the Father allow it? Why would he leave his son to endure it? To endure such pain from evil men. How did it get to this point? Hmm. Scripture interprets scripture, right? In Romans 5, Jesus gave this answer. Very truly, I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees the father doing. Because whatever the father does, the son does also. For the father loves the son and shows him all he does. Yes, and he will show him even greater works than these. So that you will be amazed. For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son gives life to whom he is pleased to give it. Moreover, the Father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the Son. That all may honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Very truly, I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. Can I tell you that this passage in the book of John is a pivotal piece? Literally, Jesus is going in one direction and then this chapter happens and he starts going in another direction. Because you see, it's in chapter 5 that Jesus heals the man at the Bethesda pool. And it's on a Sabbath. And the Jewish leaders are already looking for something to pin on him. So the trouble begins. I mean, hear these words a couple of verses earlier. Verse six and 16 and 17, it says, Now because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jews began to persecute him. But Jesus answered them, To this very day my Father is at work and I too am working. So God is working. And Jesus is working doing the Father's will. Then, of course, we have verse 18. Because of this, the Jews tried all the harder to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. This is where Jesus says, the Father and I are one. Remember his conversation with Philip? Philip? Who said, I just want to see the Father. And Jesus says, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. I mean, after the question of, have Philip, have I not been with you for so long? Jesus is doing the will of the Father. This is why... He sheds blood in the Garden of Gethsemane as he struggles with the Son of Man and the Son of God going, but I don't want to, but you need to. But I don't want to, but you need to. And then he says, Father, glorify your name. Glorify your name. And he does. He knew what he was going to do. He knew that it was going to hurt. He knew that it was a pain that we couldn't take. 
and he took it for our sake. The outrageous thing in the middle of all of this is the mention of a robe. Now please remember that God does not waste words. He doesn't. Jesus would have worn a robe that his mother made for him, crafted in love. She would have made the fabric for this robe. And scripture tells us it was seamless. Max Lucado puts it this way, it must have been Jesus' finest possession. Jewish tradition called for a mother to make such a robe and present it to her son as a departure gift when he left home. Now, we don't know if Mary actually did this. We have no scriptural place where it says she did make it. Scripture doesn't tell us. But what we do know is this, this tunic was seamless and woven from top to bottom. Lucado then asks the question, why is this significant? So how many times have you read the Bible and run across passages that said, and you should be clothed? And then humility, compassion. The Bible tells us the clothing we're to wear. Isaiah 61.10 says, He has clothed me in righteousness. It's not my righteousness or your righteousness. It's His. Because He clothes us in it. In the Psalms, I'm sorry, in 1 Peter 5, we're urged to be clothed in humility. And then, of course, there's the opposite in the Psalms where David speaks of the evil people who are clothed in cursing. Lucado goes on to say, the character of Jesus was a seamless woven fabric from heaven to earth, from God's thoughts to Jesus' actions, from God's tears to Jesus' compassion, from God's word to Jesus' response, all in one piece, all a picture of Jesus' character. But when Christ was arrested and sent to the praetorium, he was stripped of his beautiful robe. And he was stripped of his clothing. He was shamed before all who saw him. Stripped naked. And that was shame. Shame in the Jewish culture. Lucado says, the indignity of nakedness. Stripped before his mother and loved ones shamed before his family. He had the indignity of failure. For a few pain-filled hours, the religious leaders were the victors. And Christ appeared the loser. Shamed before his accusers. And worst of all, he wore the indignity of sin. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might not die, but have eternal life and live for his righteousness. The clothing of Christ in the praetorium and on the cross, he was clothed in sin. All the things we've done wrong in our life, yours and mine, the sins, the wrongs of all humanity. Can you imagine the weight? I mean, Jesus was given a gift of love from his mother and it was replaced with one that was probably an old garment lying around. Because Matthew calls this robe scarlet and Mark and John call it purple. Which some say just goes to show you that it was faded and that it was old. It was not a new robe. 
And it was probably the nearest thing they could find that would have the color of royalty to put on him to humiliate him. The aim was to make a complete mockery of Jesus Christ. Their goal was disgrace, the complete opposite of grace. Now, I don't know about you, but I've said the word disgrace so many times, I never thought of it being the opposite of grace. I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheek to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. Isaiah 50, verse 6. Jesus came to fulfill the Old Testament. But in all of this, he remained silent. Not a word. He was guilty of nothing, yet he never said a word. Nothing. As it says in Isaiah 53, 7, he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. Oh, others had declared his innocence, but Jesus never defended himself. Judas cried, I've betrayed innocent blood. Pilate announced, I find no fault in him. And washed his hands of it. Jesus' words, the last words he spoke, Father, forgive them for they know not what, what they do. In all of this, I kept feeling my prodigal self that I myself have trouble. And I, I, I know we, we said this wonderful confession. We all still sin. And if you don't, if you're going, oh, I don't know about you, Pastor, but I don't. Okay, I get on the interstate and I got news for you. I sin. And I got a feeling that could be said of some of you as well. We have those moments where Christ offers us this robe of, of purity. And we go, no, we're, we're, we're doing okay. I got to get where I need to get going. Now, I read a book years ago that I had to pick up again while doing all of this, and it's called The Return of the Prodigal by Henry Nouwen. Now, there's a robe that gets placed on the prodigal, right? Because the father says, bring in the best robe. In the story of the prodigal, the father is God. God. You see... That robe is a gift to his children to help us as we live and work in the world. Now and says, when Jesus speaks about the world, he is very realistic. He speaks about wars and revolutions, earthquakes, plagues and famines, persecution and imprisonment, betrayal, hatred and assassination. There is no suggestion at all that these signs of the world's darkness will ever be absent. But still, God's joy can be ours in the midst of it all. It is the joy of belonging to the household of God whose love is stronger than death and who empowers us to be in the world while already belonging to the kingdom of joy. Can you hear his hope? Now and had hope for us. <laughs> In spite of Jesus having this very stark, realistic view. Scripture tells us that Jesus was a man who made himself of no opinion. Okay? Opinions didn't stick to Jesus Christ. 
They just didn't. They didn't bother him. They bother us sometimes. But remember this hope because it's also in the Bible and Jesus gives it to us when he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And now and says earlier, God rejoices when one repentant sinner returns. When one person chooses to do what's right instead of staying in what's wrong and do it in joy. Now and then goes on to say, it is amazing to experience the daily radical difference between cynicism and joy. Cynics seek where darkness seek darkness wherever they go. They point always to approaching dangers, impure motives, and hidden schemes. They call trust naive, care romantic, and forgiveness sentimental. They sneer at enthusiasm, ridicule spiritual fervor, and despite despise, excuse me, despise charismatic behavior. They consider themselves realists who see reality for what it truly is and are not deceived by escapist emotions. But in belittling God's joy, God's integrity, God's robe of righteousness, their darkness only calls forth more darkness. More darkness. Folks, we have two robes before us. Two robes. We get a choice. We can keep on sinning and take the fake one, the mock one that the soldiers put on Jesus. Or we can take the one made of love. The Apostle Paul says in Galatians that Jesus changed places with us so that we could know the joy of the Lord. He changed places with us so we could understand that in spite of suffering, there is still a joy because we know that while we suffer on this earth, this spinning planet, that there is eternity waiting for us. Eternity. Now and continues, people who have come to know the joy of God do not deny the darkness, but they choose not to live in it. They claim that the light that shines in the darkness can be trusted more than the darkness itself, and that a little bit of light can dispel a whole lot of darkness. They point each other to flashes of light here and there and remind each other that they reveal the hidden but very real presence of God. These saints, as now and calls them, discover that there are people who heal each other's wounds, forgive each other's offenses, share their possessions, foster the spirit of community, Celebrate the gifts they have received and live in constant anticipation of the full manifestation of God's glory. The full manifestation of God's glory. Of God's righteousness. As he pours forth the righteousness on those who say, yes, Jesus, I'll follow you. Max Lucado then tells us Jesus was not only shamed before the people, he was shamed before heaven because he bore the sin of murderer and adulterer. He felt the same, the shame of the murderer and adulterer. And though he never lied, he bore the disgrace of a liar. Though he never cheated, he felt the embarrassment of a cheater because he bore the sins of the world. He felt the collective shame of the world. Jesus offers a robe of seamless purity and then puts our little robes of patchwork, well, with pride, greed, and selfishness. 
he takes it and puts it on himself. He changed places with us. He wore the sin and endured our pain in that robe that the soldiers put on him. He wore our disgrace to give us a robe of grace. Pray with me, please. God, we give you all thanks and praise. Lord, we know what it cost you, what you did to win our hearts. Jesus, you went to the cross. You endured the praetorium. You endured so much pain from so many sinful people. Forgive us when we forget what it cost you. When we forget who you are in our regular lives. That you are there always watching us, seeing where we are. You know us better than we know ourselves. Lord, you knit us together in our mother's wombs. May you be glorified in all that we do, Lord. Even in our stumbles, Lord, we pray that you take them and use them for your glory, not ours. That you are lifted high for this world to see that you're not done yet and you're coming back. In Jesus' most glorious name we pray. Amen.